But I, I want to think a little bit for a second about what is this conference about? I think what you're trying to do here is better understand the context within which innovation occurs, specifically for a population that is different than the prior generations, as was nicely shown on the slide. And I'd like to just throw out a way in which I think it's very different. And the difference, to my mind, which wasn't in my mind until I got up here and listened to what the prior panel said, is the phrase emotional relevancy. The millennials want emotional relevancy. They are not willing to pretend, as many intellectuals are want, that the only kind of relevancy in the world is intellectual or fiscal relevancy. There is actually such a thing as emotional relevancy. And to translate that into plain English, innovators innovate because they want to. Not because you pay them more, not because you tell them to, not because there's necessarily a crisis facing them. Most of the creative people in the world create because they feel like it, which is the reason most of the artists in the world are broke. <laughs> you didn't tell them to make art or write books or play music. They did it because they wanted to. Do you think engineers are that different than artists? It's just that growing up, when I thought about being a musician, my parents said, don't do that, become an engineer. So I almost listened. I became a physicist. And I've, I've noticed there are a number of physicists in this program keep on showing up. And I also noticed that the word practicum, Steve was talking about what goes on here at San Jose State, but physicists and practicum seem like hard to put in the same phrase. But that's because all you guys were particle physicists. I'm an acoustician. I care about sound, which is why I have comments about it. There are physicists that are down to earth, but I think this practical idea about San Jose State is a fabulous idea. Um, because no planet ever survives its first contact with reality. It just doesn't. So innovation is not an algorithm. It's not a recipe. It's not a formula. It's a stance in the universe. A person who's an innovator is a person who doesn't care that much about recipes and formulas and algorithms. It doesn't mean that a lot of us didn't go to college for 10 years and have a whole pile of degrees, and I can derive the first principles, just about anything you want to know about physics or engineering. Just because you know the formulas doesn't mean that's the answer. The answer is to size up the situation and say the first panel went over by five minutes and we're not wired up yet, and what are we going to do so that we don't have a discontinuity in the attention span of the people in the room? I'll grab a microphone, get up, and start talking before we're ready. Are we ready yet? So I can stop improvising. And, uh, wow, this is an extremely directional microphone. It really does need a question. Okay. So I do want to just say a couple of sentences about what is the Silicon Valley Innovation Institute. Um, we're a nonprofit 501c3 educational institution. And what we try to teach people is innovation resiliency. Not how to be an innovator, how to not be a stopped innovator. Because what happens when a kid has an idea, and they generally say to a bunch of adults that use these words, I have an insight, and I'd like to go that way. People go, who do you think you are? What do you think you can have a different idea? Now, the millennials didn't get that because I'm a boomer, and we were their parents. So we got tired of people telling us who do you think we are, so we translated into telling our kids. We don't, we don't say that as much. But generally, when a person has an insight, they get in trouble. And, and that's why the Innovation Institute was started, because people don't realize innovators need emotional support. They don't just need intellectual support. In fact, they don't need intellectual support at all. Just get out of their way. As our prior moderator just said, the best thing to do for an innovator is to let them innovate. But you do have to provide them emotional support, which is why the millennials want feedback. They want to be in a relationship, they want to text, they want to hang out with their bosses and each other, and they don't even regard their bosses as bosses. They don't, they don't hang out. So even though this is a conference, as business school, and it's university, and we have, like to have these structured linear things, we're going to attempt to have a little bit more of an improvised conversation. But instead of having, of making up all the subjects, I actually had a conversation with everybody in the panel and asked them what they thought were the important questions that should be asked. Just like in the prior one, you had three questions. Well, each one of them gave me three questions. And I didn't get to come up with any questions. So I'm going to sort of stop talking. Now, you've got some slides. So who else has slides? Did you I, brought some I brought them, but we, don't, we can skip them. Okay. Just chat. So here's the question. It's, um, it's quarter after 11. We have to a quarter after 12. Do you, do you want to do a brief slide thing? Or should we launch right into the questions and make it a dialogue and make it interactive? 
How do you feel? You, you, you know what? Okay, we're going interactive. And besides interacting with each other, we want to interact with you too. So who are the people with the microphones? Get ready. We're not going to do we we're not going to do the sage on the stage deal, which is we're the experts and we talk for half an hour and then when we're done talking, you all sit with your hands quietly folded in your lap and then you get a chance for the mic. No, we're gonna we're gonna ask the questions of each other and of you. And you get to participate sooner instead of in half an hour. So you can't check out for half an hour. You've got to check in right now and listen to the questions. And if somebody feels like they really have something to add to the conversation, we are regarding you as peers. We are not regarding ourselves as the sage on the stage. The phrase I like to use is the guide on the side. I think the sage on the stage model is becoming passe. I think a lot of smart people get together and they collaborate and we're going to fire it instead of doing a linear sequential thing. So, um, and I'm going to do another change up because I want to get into the questions. Instead of introducing you each and doing a linear segment of that, how about when I ask a question, since I'm going to ask the question of the person who raised it first, you introduce yourself in a way to provide the context for why you came up with this question you want to answer it. So you, you're going to kind of improvise your self-introduction as a way to make relevant what your comments and your questions are. Okay? So, uh, we're innovating. I hate talking about innovation. I want to innovate. I don't want to talk about it. There are innovation practitioners and there are innovation scholars. Because innovation practitioners don't all know how to read right. They just innovate. So, anyway, uh, I'm going to start off with that. Okay? Um, and by the way, uh, I will say a little bit to calibrate about this. We have a representative of the largest software company in the world, Microsoft, and the largest computer company in the world, HP, and a big talent oriented, HR oriented person who's been cultivating innovation talent, and a guy. An actual entrepreneur. You know how you can tell? Is anyone else wearing a t shirt? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just checking. I had a fear that I'd be the only, you know non-suit person in the room. I'm not quite that. But anyone else wear a t-shirt? That's right. Does it have a cool phrase in the back? <laughs> and who's, who's <laughs> the, did I bring some for you? I actually have HP as a client, so that's the <laughs> And Luke is the one who's the biggest innovation practitioner on the panel right now. So this is Carly. Kind of. My client. Okay. Yeah, you're an innovator too. But, but you'll, you'll get to show that up. So, Matt. Um, when I asked Matt, he, he said, you know, Microsoft has, their position in the world has changed the ecosystem substantially. Microsoft doesn't get to hold out their hand and say, kiss my ring. So when Microsoft courts innovative employees, innovative companies, people that they're trying to pull into their fold to you know, integrate and, and co-collaborate and innovate with, Microsoft is in a different place than it was 20 years ago. So I think the way you, um, I, I tried to paraphrase what you said, how have changes in giant companies' positions in the ecosystem impacted the innovation dance? Have partners become customers? So, go for it. Okay, uh, well, pleasure to be here. Um, maybe just, you know, maybe I'm a bit old school, I'll just give you a few minutes on me and, and sure. perhaps why I have a view. I certainly know Sage on the stage and more of a guy on the street. Um, at least I'm more sympathetic to that, I think. Uh, in my role in Microsoft, I won't, I've really dealt a fair bit with millennials, such as they are. Uh, prior to coming to Valley, I spent most of my time working in international development with uh, social venture and social entrepreneurs in places as uh, bureaucratic as the World Bank and the IMF. And now, in my current role at Microsoft, I'm working with young technology entrepreneurs uh, who are trying to make the next big business. Uh, and I work with them uh, hand in glove as often as I can. Um, and so to some respect, I, I, I'm struck by how often millennials today have been described as our kids. Um, I guess what I would say about your kids is they, they certainly do uh, demonstrate uh, much of the things that you've been described being today. What I think is worth talking about is how there's a difference between creativity and innovation. Innovation, at least in the context that I'm familiar with, is about how one applies an invention or a novel idea uh, to some outcome. And what I am struck by is in the entrepreneurs that I see and deal with, 
um, how while they are highly creative and cross-pollinate and think outside the box, whatever kind of metaphor you want to use, they are quite rigorous when it comes to application. There is a process in their mind, and if you believe in value being in a very place, there is a thirst for figuring out what that process is. And it's strikingly common, at least so far. Now, maybe that means it's ripe for disruption. But to, to our earlier point, what I would say, though, is as a company like Microsoft, um, we obviously have to be in tune with this because you're always renewing your employees. There's a nature of churn that is natural in any company, but particularly so in technology. And, and as we see the shifts in the technology ecosystem, we're making those shifts. And millennials help us with that very much in that they understand this idea of cross-pollination. Cross um, and so we've adjusted with that as well, this blurring of things. But what I would just leave on the thought is where we have to ask ourselves the question is, is that just creativity or application? And I do think when you talk about application, you're going to start talking about certain processes and, and, and rigorousness that is actually common. And you also are going to find yourself asking a question about organization. Right? Uh, there's a great line that says, you know, peace who says organization says oligarchy. Right? But the reality of any application is there is at least some degree of organization in order to apply it. It may be temporal, it may be virtual, and that's what we see a lot these days, but there still is something there. And I, you know, what I always ask myself with millennials is how well they can transition from all the innate things you've discussed today to the world of application. With these people with respect to your changing position in the ecosystem. So, um, hi everyone, I'm Martha Lyons. I um, actually work down uh, the highway here in Palo Alto at HP Labs, but um, I have a background working in uh, different HP businesses you know, over the last 20 years, um, actually running innovation programs and doing emerging kind of businesses and bringing things actually to market. So from the innovation uh, standpoint. So the interesting thing about uh, HP is huge, a huge company. We have businesses, you know, and, you know, from consumer base to enterprise base to, you know, all the vertical. You know, we work with banks, we work with, you know, big consumer packaged good companies. You know, the retail stores, everything that you can imagine. And it's really, um, it's it's actually quite exciting when you think about the touch points that we can have um, throughout kind of and, and we're multinational, right? So for labs. Uh, labs is kind of like a catalyst for the company, not only in that you know we have people who are doing the creative part and inventing new things, but also in that you know as a very pretty small group we represent all the businesses in the company, we, and we have labs in seven countries. Some of those countries are fairly the labs are fairly new, like in Singapore and Israel, and you know the other ones in um, the UK are older, and, and of course India and China. And so we have um, a different profile of the employee base, especially in the emerging companies that are much younger and coming out of university. We also uh, sponsor you know, you know, over 100 interns every year, and, and we hire people, postdocs who are of that age profile. But the, the interesting thing is, you know, when we, um, we when I talk about the catalyst, is that we often see things that cross over, right? All these different dimensions, and we can bring people together. So we're kind of like the LinkedIn of the company, you know, in, in a certain respect. But the the thing that we've done over the last two years is, you know, one of the problems uh, that we have in a big company is crossing the chasm. And so how do we take people who have really great ideas and have linked them together? Um, and help them, the people who might not have the skills, right, to actually, uh, you know, manage that process and to bring the funding and resources to bear to kind of go out and test those ideas and create the, you know, new businesses with, with our business partners. And so, um, about two years ago, we decided within HP Labs that we would kind of protect some funding so that we could, uh, on a yearly basis, um, encourage people to submit proposals for demonstrators. So these are outside of our um, kind of funded research programs that we evaluate and, and launch every year um, that are longer term, but actually enabling people like from a grassroots perspective to actually uh, come together and self kind of, you know, coordinate uh, a project proposal that could be across geographies. It could be with a customer. We also see, uh, you know, like a 
probably over 500 customer visits a year, and, and we co-innovate. So the program that I'm uh, that I work in is the demonstrating co-innovation program with customers. We bring in customers, and they come to us and they say, "Hey, you know, there's no, no solution. This is a big problem we have. We can't we can't do X, Y, and Z. You know, can you help us?" And we have people go and brainstorm. But then, how do we bring that um, to kind of a demonstration to show the real life uh, pr practical? Um, application of that. So we funded this program the first year. We had 17 proposals. We funded five, and they were gated. They, you know, they got the funding in November. They lost their funding the next year. And when they, the results were great because it was running more like a startup, they could use the money any way they wanted to bring in resources or buy, you know, create sensors, whatever it was, and then show uh, the results and work with the business. And some of those now are, are huge programs that we have. We did a 3D um, capture of an Earth, Wind, and Fire concert in Sundance, and then we replayed it at CES in Las Vegas. Showing up and trying to engage, um, who are very interested in developing new skills, something you put there, that I want to talk about, that HP can offer to these people a really gigantic playground. There's a lot of mobility. They, they're engaging a pretty vast, sophisticated universe, and as a technical person herself, She's aware of you know, this, this hunger of these people coming in to connect them, and she does some of that connecting them. And one of the things that, that Matt has said about Microsoft, which is also an equally vast universe, is that one of the things he asks people in these startups that they're trying to develop relationships are about their, their aspirations and their dreams and their values. So both HP and Microsoft are really trying to engage this generation with just this large sandbox and more degrees of freedom than might have been offered, say, 10 years ago. So I just want to point out that their companies are really doing some, and both of them in particular, Matt's background, unlike computer science, is in like political science, right? So Matt's more of an expert in rapport. And you might wonder what rapport has to do with innovation. Well, like everything. <laughs> everything. Because people can't operate on their dreams and aspirations unless somebody actually cares enough to ask them, and tries to create conditions that might allow them to live out some of their dreams. So um, so both of you changed my impression of Microsoft and HP, because I went from large corporations to being an entrepreneur, because I ran away from the large corporations about 15 years ago, because they, they wouldn't let me do my thing, so I went out and started six companies. But you know, I like this playground thing, maybe I should come back. <laughs> so, um, since Kevin actually, the, one of the questions he raised is he pointed out in the whole talent development area that millennials were extremely conscious of developing uh, new skills and having opportunities to develop new skills. Maybe you want to follow up on some of the things that they're offering and how that fits into who you were experiencing showing up and what they want. Sure. Um, I run a think tank called the Future Talent Institute and I work with Irene, who's doing the graphics here, and she's background. We spend quite a bit of time uh, interviewing and talking to young people and working with young people around the world, several different countries, uh, similar to some of the research the other panel did. And you know, our findings are, are very similar. But I think one of the things that I find very fascinating about this group is they're really fundamentally challenging the assumptions that we work to the world. And the assumptions that we think that you know, we, we ask how are they going to fit in our organizations, we should be asking how are our organizations going to adapt to that because they're not going to fit into our organizations. And you know, it comes to this whole idea of opportunity and skills. Uh, they want to learn all the time, constantly learning. And they don't want to be stuck in a channel or in some route to some point in the distant future. Uh, we talked about patience. They don't have that. Okay, we can say that to you, but I think it's also part of their excitement and energy about what's possible out there and how they can tap into that. And they look at the internet, they look at what's available, and they say, if you don't let me do it, I'm just going to go do it on my own. I'm going to go out and do it myself. So if you try to channel me and tell me in three years I'll get to this point, I don't care about getting to that point in three years. That's not important to me. It's not in my value system. My value system is to learn, to grow, and to do new things, to explore, to discover. And so it's, it's to the point that these companies allow them to put forward proposals and uh, you know, feel part of something bigger to achieve their goals, uh, I think they're going to be very successful. As soon as they start saying, you've got to be on this team for two years, or you've got to be this for 18 months, or you, you know, the HR policies come into play, which really start to increase turnover and make it very difficult to retain or even attract these people to your organization in the first place. And I, as well as Lisa, do a lot of work in the recruiting space, and that's half my business. 
Uh, and I can tell you that most of them don't want to work for you next. Um, you know, they want to work for themselves or small entrepreneurial firms where they have a lot of freedom and they can do what they want to do. So it's not opportunity, but not necessarily in our definition of opportunity, like take these courses, follow this route, do it our way. It's more the McDonald's thing, do it my way. Uh, and that's really, uh, and if you don't let them do it their way, they'll just go do it anyway. And, and that's the beauty of the internet, and that's the beauty of the technology that we've developed. Is I, I wanted to do that, and I couldn't. Okay? I wanted to tell the company, stop it, and I'm going to go do my own thing. But I didn't have the, the money and the resources required 20 years ago to do that. Today, you can go out and start Facebook without much of an investment other than your brain. And, and they know that, and that's a good thing. So a common thread I'm hearing from all three individuals is degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom. You have to provide degrees of freedom to people if you want them to innovate. This is not just true of millennials. It's true of anybody who has an idea. But to our prior panel, it's the last statement that get out of the way. <laughs> Give them degrees of freedom. But I want, before turning it over to let you guys ask questions, I want you to introduce Luke. You to introduce yourself. But you asked a really, you wrote a provocative uh, question that I think could tail end onto this. You raised the issue of the qualitative versus the quantitative in terms of innovation. You know, I want to take a step back. Uh, okay. I, find it, I mean, yeah. hi, Luke, um, innovationgames.com, find out. Um, <laughs> and tweet, tag, poundinofgame.com. And if you're not tweeting, what are you doing? And the, the answer is, I'm looking around the room and I'm seeing this. Does this, I, I just got to say it, does this feel at all innovative or collaborative to you? Be truthful. <laughs> no. Not yet. Thank you. Can someone, um, can I get a witness over there? No, they're sleeping. How about over here? <laughs> does this feel innovative or collaborative? No. Not at all. Well, the, the young people are like, oh, the old people are like, can I answer that? <laughs> Come on. And, and, oh, let's make our millennials, you know, happy. Why not make the workforce happy? I thought our panel was about the workforce, not the millennials, right? So the goal is to make the workforce enable it. And so I'm, I'm a really dangerous man because I believe that you can, in fact, have your workforce talk to your customers. <gasps> Wait, that's dangerous because the druids in market research want you to wear robes, worry about he has statistical significance, or the boss wants to hire a high-power, high-priced design firm who's basically selling, my people are smarter than your people, give us your problem, we'll solve it for you, we'll do your ethnography for you, and we'll take the photos for you, and we'll do the right research for you. And oh, we're gonna charge you, you know, about $50,000 a day? And the boss was cool, looking good. Paying a lot of money. Innovation, worth a lot. And so, what, <laughs> she's now, what, what we are on a mission is to, empower people to start with the root of where innovation comes from, which is putting yourself in the place of what you don't know you don't know, and learn to be comfortable in ambiguity, which is, in effect, fancy, oh, fancy term, qualitative market research. Okay, we, we just, how about talking to customers? How about talking to people? How about the answers are outside, not in here? And how about doing it in a way that people of all ages, of all cultures, and all backgrounds can feel engaged, which is way better than, hey, what do you want me to build? Dude, come on, tell me. I'm an engineer. I care about you. What's your problem? That's not going to work. So what does work? What works is activities. What works are games. And that's what we do. We design and produce in-person and online games that help organizations solve extremely complex problems. Most of the time in the domain of innovation, which is in new. And when I see a room like this, I think about what we produced for Mayor Chuck Reed in the city of San Jose on January 29th. Well, we had over 100 community leaders in the room playing games to prioritize the budget of San Jose and help the city solve a massive problem, a 100 million plus dollar problem. Get to Sacramento, quick. <laughs> Help me get to Sacramento. We provide, my we have a team of over 400 trained facilitators around the world. Anyone raise your hand, stand up. Stand up. Stand up. 
There's a trained facilitator. Yes, yes, Nina. There's a trained facilitator. We are creating an army of people. And what we're trying to do is to say, look, the answers are outside, and the millennials want to get there, and there's a tiny little bit, right? A tiny little bit of chili powder makes the pot of chili very tasty. But no chili powder, not so good. And a tiny little bit of chili powder is a tiny little bit of training that gives them an interaction framework better than a direct question. And you can transform all sorts of stuff. So qualitative and getting people out there, regardless of their millennialness, I guess I'm a millennial, I'm not wearing a watch. <laughs> That's the key. To go a little further on this, you know, okay. mentioned <laughs> the, uh, your concept about maximizing the surface area of your employees to yeah, the market I mean, and the employees. The, the, could you tell people the your market concept? surface area? I mean, um, mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you a, I'll give you a couple of concrete examples from clients. Right, one of our clients is Cisco, and we did some really interesting research with Cisco on um, the future of video at work. And one of the things, of course, people are finding out is, you know, you talk about, well, why can't I do X or Y or Z? The millennials are like, yeah, here's my flip phone, or here's my, you know, here's my flip phone, here's my flip, or here's my iPhone, and I just want to take a video and I'll post it on Go, right? And Cisco's like, cool, bandwidth consumption, we like that, <laughs> right? How do, we, how do we add a little fuel to that fire? Right? More routers. And what was unique about that approach was we've done so many training sessions and so many games at Cisco because we're believing in empowerment that most of the research was done by Cisco employees with Cisco uh, uh, potential market participants as opposed to by my firm being the smart druids and rogues. And, and we can give you dozens of examples of increasing the service area because if you're agile, then you're moving faster. And if you're moving faster than your cycles are compressing, and if in fact your cycles are compressing, traditional forms of market research will fail you. Because you cannot do it fast enough. So what can you do? You can increase the surface area and you can lower your transaction costs. So I walk up to HP and I say, I want you to spend the same amount of market research dollars that you're doing now. I'm not asking you to lower your price. I want you to learn how to talk more frequently. Because if you're doing all that other stuff, you have to learn how to talk more frequently, too. And the only way you can get there is to increase the surface area of letting your customers, uh, letting your employees talk to customers. I, I did a talk at the Qualitative Research Consultant Association. I was a keynote speaker. And they were freaking out. They were asking questions like, I read your book. You don't use a glass mirror. Why would I separate my customers from their customers and through a glass mirror? And someone else raises their hand, and we looked at your book, and you don't use discussion guides. Like, no, I don't. Discussion guides are based on fear. I don't believe. There's nothing a customer that can say to me that will make me afraid. And a discussion guide is a way to prevent something, because you're afraid. So I want to I wanna, I wanna enable all that. And I wish we were playing games, because it would be all more fun. <laughs> I think Luke has just in part answered, I think it was Isabella's last question about what do you do when your employees treat faster than they think? This is part of the answer. You hand them two phones. <laughs> Transparency, honesty, consistency, communicate. You don't have to worry about manipulating people if you're telling them the truth. It's not about employees treating faster than they can think. They are. They are tweeting faster than you can think. Yeah. <laughs> the same thing. If you're telling the truth, then people will go as fast as they want, and you're transparent and you're honest, then you're going to come out okay. But if you're trying to tell different things to different people and manipulate the situation, you're going to lose because the internet allows people to triangulate on the truth. They can get so many different sources of information that they can cooperate whatever line you're giving them, and if you're not telling the truth. Yeah, but can we just also put a plug in for plain old wetware? Right? I mean, there's hardware and there's software and there's wetware. And, you know, I know it's all internet, ooh, internet, ooh, but, you know, there's a lot to be said for what Eileen is doing over there and actually having, like, ooh, people talk with people. You know, you go to India and you see a photo, and eh, go to India and smell. You go to Mexico City and you see a photo, go to Mexico City and take a bite of the street vendor food. Best falafel in the world ain't here. Go to Tuttlebee. 10 o'clock at night on the street. They'll be happy. So, it, it, he makes an important point, though, because um, the, the question we have to ask ourselves, you know, wherever stage you're in the workforce, is how much is that actually going on? 
So you use all those countries, for example. And I'm fortunate enough to, to I think I've traveled to 55 different cities across the world. And, and your point is exactly right. What I would say to your other point, there seems to be a level of technophilia here. Like, we're confusing the advances in technology with something, in my view, that's, a bit, you know, that's more substantial than it is. Because technologies are basically tools that people use. Let's never get, don't confuse those things. People use technology. We haven't got the singularity yet. Right? Maybe we never will. And if people use technology, people need to experience things. And I think we're aware that it's a large organization or a small one. What breaks down, I think, is the following. When people start to experience other people, they're generally uncomfortable with it at first. And this is my point about application. If you want to apply something, by nature you need other people around you who believe in what you're doing. And that's hard. And I would say this, my experience, you know, about, you know, what you get, it comes to a certain degree of experience and maturity. You watch the 24-year-old startup entrepreneur that I get to hang around with, they're wonderfully creative. The good ones mature very quickly. They may be 24, but they're like 45 in the way they behave. The ones that don't, they still feel like 24-year-olds. Right? So, so I think there's something really there, which is... And what's interesting here is you need to experience other people, you need to accept other people, hell is not other people, and you need to apply them to a problem. What's interesting is, talk about tweeting. Tweeting is not, in some respects, experiencing other people in any intimate sense. If you spend a lot of time on Twitter, you'll quickly understand that, right? And you should experience Twitter. There's something fascinating going on there, I'm not quite sure what it is, but there's something that we need to really think about when we talk about this generation or the other, which is, is emotional connection that comes with being around other people. What happens now in technology, in my view, is you can get something close and approximating that, but you can be confused by it and think it's really, truly really intimate when it is not. Right? I can see what happened in Colorado through Twitter, through YouTube. I did not experience it. When you confuse those two, problems are so I, I didn't tell the truth. You didn't get the audience involved in that first time for half an hour. Uh, so. Um, two, quick, two quick comments. I really liked what Luke was talking about, about the idea of innovation being people working together. It seems to me that too many times in too many organisations, especially in universities, what they're not doing is giving people spaces to work together. There's lots of talented people. It's just a case of giving them time and space and processes to work together. So I wanted to ask Luke, though, how you think he likes to services the unknowable, how he services the, the kind of tacit knowledge which helps us kind of leverage innovation. But I also wanted to take issue with um, Jay Matthew Clark. I'm sorry to <laughs> Matthew. Um, when you say that the technology is not important, I think it's incredibly important. I think that... Um, What's happening now is technology shape social interaction. That the nature of that technology infrastructure shapes how we do things. If you just want to take a, a frivolous example, if you look at something like Facebook, you look at the way the feed, the design of the feed on Facebook actually shapes how people interact. We are now moving to a situation where most information systems are outsourced. There are major infrastructure platforms. You, you've got kind of duopolies emerging. So if you like, the technology is becoming a lot more material. So there is, you know, definitely a reflex of relationship. I agree people are incredibly important, and we can help shape that. But it's definitely a reflexive um, relationship. So I look forward to uh, your responses. <coughs> what if you think well, I, I, I would certainly <coughs> never suggest technology is not important. Uh, but if that was what I conveyed, I apologize. That's certainly not my intent. I would say, though, we have to accept that, that people are the people who, who are going to interact with that technology. And certainly, the technologies we have today create experiences. What my point is, we should not confuse those experiences with the technology, with experiences with other people. And, and when we do that, again, that's where I think problems go. Problems go. And I, I think we're probably completely online. I mean, we're the only firm that I know of that has the exact same game in person and online. And you just, it's, we've got to stop phrasing, you've got to eradicate either or from your vocabulary about the way that you collaborate or the way that you work. It's always yes and. 
it's always been at times we're sitting down and we're sitting on the same piece of paper or working and I mean paper is a tool. Just like Facebook's a tool. So it's got you've got to find the way to be yes and. Um, and and the question that you had for me or the comment that I'm supposed to address that I that my I had my husband years on, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's a, um, that's, a, that's a cheap, gratuitous plug for my book. Um, um, but I, I really think it's, it, it roots around into three areas. One, it's about a question, not a con it's, it's about, I'm sorry, it's about a context that you create, not a question that you're asking. So I think that's a, the first rule is we, we work on the context, not, not the question, right? I think the second thing is that um, there are, uh, a variety of well-known ways to create an opportunity for a person or a group of people to come together to explore a problem. And um, I am totally against any kind of creativity training because you don't need to be taught to be creative. You're, you have math, language, and opposable forms built in. You are creative. What you do need to do in organizations is you need to create a context where that creativity can occur. Um, Different organizations create that context in different ways. She, you talked about a great way that HP has created a concept for creativity called special money, right? That you can get Emerson Electric has a similar program. It's called SIT, this uh, special incentive program. And if you get shot down in a gate review, you can go to corporate and ask for money, and they have a couple hundred million dollars that they do exactly what you did. It's a venture model, and venture model is the pure stage gate, and it's really great. So for me, it's, it, it's do I have games designed to, and create that? Yes. And so um, there are other activities that you can do to put yourself into a position, into a context that is allowing you to explore things. And that's all I think it's about. So I want to just let our host ask the question, because we've only one person in the audience speaking, and I know yeah. we could we could do this for a whole time. Just this is what people want. You've been patiently waiting. Well, you said you said you were not sages on the stage, but I'm going to ask the question of the sages anyway. That is, as an educator, and given that we are turning out a lot of graduate students and undergraduate students coming into the workforce, all millennials, at all very digitally oriented. What advice would you give? me and many of the professors in here on what we can do differently to improve innovation so that we can I'm going to give a one sentence answer the turn to you because you listen. It's the single answer is listen. These people really have a lot to say and, and that's why I, I don't like the sage on the stage model. I, I was a professor for 10 years. I was a physical professor and dean of Cosmo Polytechnical College. I, had, I found professors have a tendency to Sometimes think that they know a hundred times more than the student, and right now, they don't. But anyway, there's something to say. Yeah, I think I think it's uh, I think Western is a good thing. I think from an academic perspective, I think in the university systems where I spent a lot of time as a teacher and as a student and as a, as a student of them, I think it's about tearing down the interdisciplinary walls. I think it's about creating a much more uh, uh, integrated approach to education that looks at it not from the business school and the engineering school and the, and so forth, but from a much more integrated uh, and holistic way and not prescribe to the students what they should take where, but let them choose what they want to take where because they potentially have an idea or a mindset, which they do, about what they might want to do. And I think, you know, we are in this position, all of us, the boomers and the Xers in particular, particularly boomers, that we're in control and we know more than they know. And if we don't tell them what to do, they'll go astray. And I think that's just a total fallacy. And I don't think that we necessarily know more than they do. Uh, I think they intuitively know where the world's going a lot better than we do. 
Uh, and I think they're very capable of, of charting their own course in a much more flexible way than we allow them to do. And I think the open universities and some of these things are fostering innovation and creativity in a much greater way than the traditional universities are because uh, you're able to have more flexibility. I think we're sort of trapped in two worlds, but I understand from the administrator's point of view that you're turning out a person with a particular degree to go work in a particular discipline and therefore there's an expectation of a certain amount of knowledge. On the other hand, I think that model's changing, and I think we're in a lot of flux right now, and I think we need to explore that in a lot more uh, innovative way with our perfect partners as academics and say, you know, you know, what, how can we make this a more useful person for you? And, and I think listening to the young people, uh, and when you listen to the young people, you hear this over and over, not, they don't know really maybe how to articulate it in our language, but they're really saying, Take the chains off me. Let me go do what I want to do. I think I know what I want to do. I know things that I want to study that I'm curious about and interested in. And yet I can't do it because I've got to fill all these requirements to get this degree. Uh, so I think we just need to really think about that. I think we're not turning out innovative people at all. I think the innovative ones aren't going to be university. And that's the challenge. They're dropping out. And look at enrollments. Look at mostly, right now, boys aren't going to school. You know, over, uh, you know, over half the students in most universities are women. Uh, and it's probably a gender bias that women are a little bit more cautious than men. But I think the men are probably just uh, through a lot of bias in our society, feeling more capable of going out and doing their own thing, and they go do it. So, you know, I think the really creative, innovative people, uh, you know, the, the college dropouts like Michael Dell and Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and, and hundreds of others, the entrepreneurs, they're finding the universities not meeting their needs at all. And that they, if you really want to be creative and innovative, you go out and do it. And you learn through practicums and in real life and through coaching and informal learning and all sorts of other kinds of tools. So I think there's a model that's emerging uh, around coaching, around online learning, uh, around experiential learning that universities need to start figuring out how to tap into. I have a two-word answer. Um, authentic questions. So if you summarize all they're saying, I mean, um, some of you may know the name Elliot Soloway. He's at Michigan. I had studied for, under Elliot for five and a half years. So, you, you know, and I, I'm going to quickly summarize. Authentic questions from a learner are what engages the learner in the act of learning. And I really believe that a lot of the problems that we have in our educational system it, are not learner problems. They're they're people who teach are frightened to death about the actual exploration of authentic questions because they don't know how to deal with it themselves. And so sometimes I think we forget, as we focus on the learner, that we also have to focus on the institution that is supporting the teacher. So uh, we say we say to you, uh, you know, you should let your 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 students ask authentic questions and explore what they want to do. And they come up to you and they say, well, I want to learn how to do, you know this thing. And you as, a, as an educator go, oh crap, I have no idea what that is. Now what do I do? I'm now in the learning space with them. And I actually think that part of the problem that we have from the larger systemic structure of how do we create innovative people is that we also have to support the educational system itself in supporting the, the professors who are now put into a position where they're just as much of a learner. And that's kind of hard to do, right? I'm not in your world, but how does it feel to not get tenure because you didn't know what the question was from your student? Maybe not so good. I so, so, wait, wait a second. So you've been patiently waiting. Is this part of this or are you going to change the subject? Because I'm just wondering if we should let somebody from that generation comment. So you go right after me. So Michael, since you're the only person who okay. actually is in this generation. Sure. Um, <laughs> I, I just wanted to um, respond to that. And I think that all the things that you guys are saying would, if there was a school that did all that, that would be like amazing. Um, I went to a school in um, Washington State called the Evergreen State College, and it's actually an accredited university, but um, it tries to do a lot of this type of thing and break down the, um, inter have very interdisciplinary program, and um, yeah, there's no majors there, and there's also no grades there, and, um, but it, you still can translate into a GPA and it's an accredited school, so it's a very interesting model they're trying to pioneer. I think they're the only school left in the country that does that. I think UC Santa Cruz used to do evaluations too, but um, has moved more traditional. And um, 
it's a challenging model. There's a lot of um, th reasons why things are the way they are. But um, as I now going out, I'm starting to really value a lot of the experiences I had there and the approach that they were using. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, essentially just the um, like the action learning community. And uh, one thing they do there is um, you can get a sponsorship from a professor to do an independent learning thing where you would go do an exp you would go meet with I don't know some people they want to go learn how to make uh, canoes in the traditional Indian way or what, you know there's different projects that people take on you find a sponsor and then you do that for ten weeks and then you have a, someone you know who's helping you making sure that you're you know meeting your goals and you have to create your own questions that you're going to go answer and it's just a very different approach I think that lets you try to do some of the things you're interested in. And I don't think everyone's like a Bill Gates or Adele who's that self-driven, and that's a good way to kind of move into that direction. If you're not like that, you could at least start to experience that sort of thing. There's support and it's encouraged. Um, so I just wanted to say that's something you might want to like check out and talk to folks up there. It's uh, interesting. You've been yeah. One of the things would be interesting to hear from the panel is what's being done relative to trans-border innovation with millennials. That is, to what extent are UHP or IBM linking across borders, across boundaries, across continents? Because, of course, you now creating products and services for a global market. And Luke, to the same question for you relative to your game and that technology, if you will, how are you using that potentially for problem solving that do go beyond global order? Well, um, so, you know, like I said before, we have. Um, well, I'll just do it from a lab point of view, but this is true and reflective of HP and the businesses as well. I think China is one of the biggest growing markets for the PC business now, and tablets and cell phone and all this. But um, when we created the India Lab, which is in downtown Bangalore, um, you know, probably over 10 years ago, they were tasked with um, figuring out how to engage um, that marketplace of consumers who are high frequency consumers. Have you ever heard? What we found out, and this goes to your your point about service, increasing the service area, is you know if you don't uh, have people on the street in the countries you're trying to sell to, you really don't understand the market, and they can have as much customer uh, you know contact as they want. But you know how Procter and Gamble sells shampoo in India? Is they sell you know one day use packets because you know I don't know if you guys know this. In in a lot of cases, people can only um, purchase what they need. Every so they well, we can search the web and see what employees are saying. But I would say this, there's, and this is not my idea, there's a fellow named Stan Slap. And, and what you often see in corporations is they will espouse corporate values. And things like that are often supposed to be associated with a value. Again, I don't think corporations have values. And Slap's language is good ones. Corporations don't have values, they have t-shirts that claim they have values. <laughs> People have values, and the biggest challenge in a workforce, and I think with millennials as well, is when the purported corporate value is not being applied by the managers in a consistent, everyday fashion. <coughs> I would just like, oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm done. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Sorry. No. Uh, I just just one, one little uh, two-second comment on that. You know, I don't think you get much innovation really out of most young people in these companies today. And most of them, if they're coming up with ideas, they're working with these on their own time at home or at night, and they're going to leave and start their own company, but they've already started it. I'm working with a half a dozen young people right now who work in large, well-known companies in the Valley that are developing their own things. The company will never hear about these things. They will never be given to the company because there is no reward other than hierarchy and promotion and maybe a $500 reward if it's a patent. Uh, and this is no longer the way the world works. So these young people are just going to take their product and they're going to go do it themselves. And so I think the companies just I think we can reward innovation. You're only rewarding us old guys. You know, you're really not getting to these young people. I really believe. And, and if you want to meet some of these people, come to our program in July, which is about the Hacker Dojo. This is a, I don't know if many of you have heard of it. There's a Hacker Dojo locally where all the people who are engineers at Google and Intel and Apple. Go there after work to start companies. Yeah, yeah we help fund it. It's on Wishman Road in Mountain. You should hang it out. But but I want to challenge everyone in the room in the panel too. Like one of the things that really uh, one of my clients is Emerson Climate Technologies, and they're building a, a, an incredible uh, bet, a bet a division of a billion dollar company on 
on a one of their big bets is called the Intelligence Store. And the Do it quick so we can our assumption. Yeah, it'll, what? Do it quick so we have four minutes. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so, so the, 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 the Intelligence Store basically starts with, think of a home thermostat, intelligent home thermostat, except make it a, a very sophisticated computer that can control every outlet of any kind in a supermarket of a size of Safeway. Then wire up all of the Safeway stores all over the country into a back end data center so that when you know the California Utilities Commission says, hey, cut your power, then you go to the data center and half the power is cut off. Or you're doing a demand load shedding or infrared refrigerant leak detection systems and you're doing all this stuff, right? One of the things that really frightens me, genuinely frightens me about, ooh, it's great, millennials, two people in a garage and sandals, go innovate. There are problems that we're facing that those people can't even budge. Like you can't even nudge unless you are a Microsoft or unless you are an HP. And, and so there's this innovation schism that's being created because just kind of for the record, you can read it in your annual report, Everson's got $5 billion budgeted for the intelligence store. That's with a B. And there are world-changing innovations that we need to survive as a planet that are just, you know, no offense to the two dudes in a garage or, you know, two people in a garage, that's just not going to move it. It's just not enough. No way, no how, no anything. And VCs aren't going to fund it either. Because some of the stuff that these guys fund, VCs wouldn't even come close to. I mean, that's one thing I'm also. Let's stop. celebrate some big things here. Let's just say you can connect all those people in garages together with a network called the internet. It's far more robust. And you create a virtual HP across the world. Where's the hardware? Networks. Where is the where's the machine tools? Where's the where's the ability to build the chips in the hard? I get the software side of that. Check. Fold it. It's fold it proved is his model. If you guys know what fold it is, fold it is the protein folding game. No, it's, right? it's a good concept. Where's the hardware? But we're not going to answer it in the next 60 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> My question is actually coming back to the concept of games. So